Hey friends, we're here. Finally, the first episode of the Unlaced podcast. Uh, this has been a bit of work in the making, but we're super glad to bring this forward to you and even happier that I could do this with one of my good friends, Johnny McCain, who, when I look back on my career, made playing football fun and was just a great man, a great leader, fierce competitor. Played at the highest level for over 16 years and is a former Socceroo and Olympian, uh, where in this episode he goes into some of the challenges he had off the field playing overseas, being away from family, and most recently the transition he's taken outside of football. I really hope you enjoy it and thank you so much for tuning in, it means a lot. Johnny McCain! Here we go, JBD. Welcome to the Unlaced Podcast, mate. Thank you, brother. Pleasure to be on with you. Episode, um, episode number one. It's it's a big deal. I'm gonna be honest. We've uh, we thought we'd go for the big gun early, Johnny McCain, and um, <laughs> well, you could have thought the other way, right? Start at the bottom, JBD. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Who was gonna pick up the phone first? <laughs> nah, mate. Uh, I really do appreciate it. I think actually one of the reasons why I was really keen on getting you on first is because the whole concept behind the podcast was something I actually spoke to you about probably about a year and a half ago um, around just athlete transition and like some of the mental health stuff that comes with it. And you probably know a lot of boys, especially around the footballing scene that have been through some stuff uh, in this space, including myself. And I kind of came to you just like, Johnny, what do I do? <laughs> um, I've got this idea of, I think I can help, but I'm not sure how, and you were, you're pretty open to helping me out and, and push me on. So uh, we we finally got here at a bit of a platform we're trying to do for it. So I thought it'd be no better to have you on and start, start talking about some of these issues and things like that. Pleasure, JBD. Anytime, mate. Um, so for, for those that don't know, Johnny, Johnny McCain is superstar of the game. One of my former teammates at uh, Adelaide United, um, and I'm actually a little bit embarrassed to say it, but I didn't actually realise until about five days ago you were an Olympian um the 2004 olympics so i'm keen to maybe get a bit of background on that journey and how you got there you've been googling jbd yeah, yeah. i have i'm ashamed <laughs> i played you for two years didn't know <laughs> oh, i don't talk about that stuff mate Stays I, aside, right? I don't know if it's a, a humble side of you or that i should have known that well, that was a um that was a it was probably one of my biggest honors if i'm if i'm open when i when i was a young kid growing up all i ever dreamed about was going to the olympics it was never going to a World Cup or, or, or you know, Confederations Cup or, or, you know, really playing for my country as a soccer. It was really my, my big dream was going to the Olympics and representing Australia um, at the Olympic Games, mate. So it, it's a strange one because um, only later on in my career did I, you know, when, when I got a bit older, probably in my teenage years, when I when I started, you know, having a dream about playing for for the national team of Socceroos, but. My, my, my dream as a young boy growing up and practicing in the backyard was always to, to go to the Olympics. Um, That's crazy. So pretty blessed to have, uh, yeah, pretty blessed to have achieved that, that, that goal that, you know, was, was deep inside me as a young kid. Yeah. So yeah, 2004 <laughs> Olympic games, mate. It's a while ago now, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Were you born then, mate? <laughs> oh, yes, mate. I was uh, 11 years old, but we won't go into yeah. that. But a lot yeah. of people, uh, people probably don't know, um, who, who aren't close to football, but the Olympic Games for, for football is an under 23 competition, isn't it? So that's right. You're yeah. Essentially, you know, you're a young, you're a young man, if not a kid. Um, yeah, it, it's a, it's an under 23 competition, and you have normally three overage players. Yeah. So we were we were fortunate at, at, at the 2004 Olympics. We had um, a guy called Timmy Cahill, who most people hopefully will know. Um, Craig Moore, who again, hopefully most people will know. And Johnny Aloisi, who hopefully people know as well. So, yeah. three of arguably the best players of their, you know, the, the golden generation that, that I came through in three really strong positions on the field a striker, a midfielder, and obviously a central defender. So, we had a fair bit of experience and assistance there from the older boys. Um, and it was, a, it was a really enjoyable tournament. Disappointing yeah. in, in, in some regards because we, we got beaten in the, in the quarterfinals against um, a team that. You know, we, we, we against Iraq, they had one shot on goal and scored, and we had something like 25. One of those games where you just you, you lose, but it's it's a frustrating one because you know you're the better team and you did everything right and you, you should have scored four or five goals, but 
it didn't eventuate. And in, in, a, in a major tournament like that, it, it, it's hard to swallow. So. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other side of it is you get, the, you get the massive high of getting there and then the, the knockout, it, the effect of like, well, that's that dream over, isn't it? Pretty quickly. That's right. Yeah. And what they don't tell you is, you know, the Olympic Games, everyone thinks, oh, fantastic parties and, and you know, <laughs> hanging out in the village, all that stuff, right? Like everyone thinks of that stuff. But because of football, it, it's such a long tournament spread out over, you know, multiple multiple um, venues, multiple weeks. It's You start before the actual Olympic Games ceremony begins and then you finish quite a long way if you go quite deep. So we only actually had a couple of days in the village. Um, mm-hmm. So, and that was once we got knocked out and it wasn't, you know, as I dreamed of JVD, so to speak, yeah, having fun yeah. at the end of it. Yeah. It was a, it was a great experience. Uh, that's awesome, mate. And I think um, one, of, one of the things I was most intrigued about, especially playing with you was you played what was it, over 15, 16 years as a pro, right? Um, at the high, at the highest level, essentially, but a large part of your career, you actually played overseas. Yeah. Um, majority of so I'm keen to understand I guess the other side of the fence of that because obviously a lot of fans like myself we look at football as what they do on the field but we don't understand all the sacrifices that come with it to get to get to the top but also the other side of the fence when you're overseas um, leaving family behind friends behind a lot of people you know behind to, to kind of venture into a dream and what you're doing alone Keen to hear a little bit around that side of the journey, what you experienced outside of the pitch when you were playing overseas for so long. Yeah. Um, my journey, as every player's journey should be, was was unique, right? Like, I didn't go to the places that I probably dreamed of going. I ended up, my first move overseas was to Romania. Um, so, I played in the old NSL back in the day for the Brisbane Strikers for three and a half years. And then I... Um, I knew it was coming to end, an end. Everyone knew that the NSL was finishing for, for you know, that 18-month period to, to form the new A-League, as, as everyone knows now. And I didn't really want to stay and, and play in the NPL or, or the local league, as it was called back then. Believe it or not, the Queensland Forex League, JVD, it was called. <laughs> yeah. What a suit of me, mate. But, proud, um, proud Queensland, <laughs> Jerry McCain. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. But I, I thought, you know, I wanted to test myself. And I had a, I had a mate that was a, he was a Romanian guy that, that was an, that, that knew an agent. And he said to me, what about you, you, you? What about we go to Romania? One of his mates was a coach of a team over there. And I was, I was um, you know, I was 20 years old, 19 at the time. I said, what do you mean, Romania? No chance. I'm not, no, no, no. I'm not going there. I'm going to England. I'm going to Germany. I'm going to Spain, right? I'm going to the big teams. No, I'm not going there. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more we discussed it was, you know, go and have a look. Flights pay for, nothing to lose, you know, if I might actually enjoy it. And... Um, at the end of the day that the coach of the team picked up the phone and, and he rang me and he was a, you know, for, if you've got some older listeners that understand the football history, there was a, there was a guy called Volta Zenga who is an Italian goalkeeping legend, played, I think, 500, 600 games for Inter Milan, was World Goalkeeper of the Year three years in a row, wow. played at World Cups, was, was an absolute legend of the game. Yeah. And, you know, I grew up watching a fair bit of Serie A, so, so I knew who he was and I was blown away that this guy won was on the phone to me two could potentially be my coach and three spoke really good English. So um, how, how, old were you at, how old were you at the time? You were 20. I was just turning 20. Yeah. yeah and if I, 20. if I remember in that, and this may, you may have been one of the catalysts, but at that time there was a few Aussies playing in Romania, weren't there? Oh, I was a catalyst, mate. Don't worry yeah, about that. I thought you would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, no, I went, I went over the first year at, at a club called National Bucharest. Yeah. And, Funnily enough, that, that first year I was, you know, like you said, I was in a foreign country by myself, didn't know the language, didn't know a single person, mate. And it was scary. It was tough. Mm. I was homesick. I was, I was scared. It was challenging. But to be fair to the club, they really looked after me. And, and like I said, the coach was really good, spoke English, and that made a massive difference. So at the back of that first year, it was probably, to be fair, it was probably one of the best years of my career that first year I actually played. Um, and that made it all, all, all the more easy because, as we talked about earlier, I went to the, the, got selected for the Olympic Games. And, and at the back of that first year where I had, the, the coach and the president came to me and said, Johnny, we like you. We like Australian players. We want to make this Australian team. What are some other Australian players that we can get? And I said, well, you're in luck because 
you know, the NSL's finishing and, you know, I'm going to the Olympic Games, as you guys know. So you can pretty much have the pick of the Australian players, whoever you want. Yeah. So what ended up happening is they got on a flight and came and watched a few games of the Olympics and ended up speaking to me and saying, we like him, him and him. So I said, yeah, no problem. So I spoke to these guys, Wayne Troy, Ryan Griffiths and Michael Twaite. And, and the NSL, just for, for context, sorry, is, was the A-League before the A-League, right? That was the That's league, right, yeah. the main league in yeah. the country. Yeah. yeah. The National Soccer League, it was, was called. So for, yeah. for, for the older listeners, the old, the old professional league, but it was semi-professional in those days. So, <laughs> um, yeah, he ended up coming over and he liked those three. And I spoke to these boys and they were in the same boat as me just, you know, a year later, deciding what to do, not really sure what to do outside of playing in the local league and said, why not? So that second year, we had four Australians in, in one side and probably six months later, another club, Cryova, ended up bringing three or four other Aussies off the back of, you know, us, I guess, doing quite well there and other clubs thinking, okay, Australians might be all right at football. Let's let's go down that route. So, yeah, mate, there was, there was eight or nine of us at one time, actually, which was pretty cool. God, that must have been awesome. I can imagine, especially for you, when you were the first one going there, not knowing the the language the Romanian they speak, but not not Romanian. knowing that yeah, not knowing the language, um, and then all of a sudden having an influx of Aussies to have around you would have been yeah, like yeah, it was pretty it was it was pretty cool, good learning experience. Like that first year, I really didn't want to learn the language. I'm like, no, nah, what do I want to learn a language for? And I didn't really jump into the culture. I guess I stayed by myself a little bit, which made it really challenging. Um, once the Aussie boys came, then again, it, it, it made it a bit more familiar and I could understand and speak English and felt like I had more of a little a bit of a bond. Um, mm. And then after that second year, I, I, got, I, I got sold to, to another club in Romania and um, with a coach by the name of Georgie Hadji, who you're, you're, you're one the, of the, the greatest famous. football. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was That's coach, amazing. Coach. Yeah. Yeah, one of the famous Romanian footballs of all time. So he brought me and a few other players to, to the club. And um, only then did I start thinking, you know what, I've got to make an effort now and start learning the language and understanding the people a little bit more. And I think that's when it kind of clicked. Um, mm. So I actively learned the language, can speak it now to this day and have some good mates, which made that you know extended period of time a lot easier. Because I think if, if you make that effort, it, it makes it a lot easier, not only for yourself, but um, yeah. for everyone else. What, what what's that like for you? I mean, when you get that opportunity to go play overseas, obviously probably the initial thought thought is, um, oh, I'm pumped, you know, this is a great opportunity. But when you're actually there and that, that downtime of, of not really having people around you, what's that experience like? How do you keep yourself busy? Yeah, it's hard, mate. I, I used to watch McLeod's daughters. <laughs> no joke, no word of a lie. So to be fair, there was a lot of TV shows that were in English and, I used to watch every single episode of that show, mate. So that's, that's yeah. pretty sad. But yeah, it's hard, mate, because the internet wasn't as, as good as it is now. There was no Netflix. It was very much DVDs, watching TV, um, speaking on the phone if possible to, to family. It, it, it was lonely, mate. It, it yeah. was hard. I think one of the, the, the best things f- for me was the fact that there was nothing to come back to. You know, there was no league. There was nothing that really was... You know, I wanted to entertain. So it was kind of, look, you're going to do this and there's no turning around. You, you, you're going to stay here and adapt or, you know, you go home and never come back again. So I think that the olive branch of having nothing to, to turn around and go to was was a really good motivator, mate. Maybe yeah. stick in and suck it out a bit longer than potentially I would have. That's amazing. Yeah, and you would have grown so much from that experience, I imagine, which probably helped. Yeah, it was hard, mate. Like, I, I can't remember how many birthdays I've had by myself. Yeah. I can't remember how many of my mates' parties and, you know, birthdays and christenings and major family events that, that I've missed um, that I haven't been present for. So, you know, you look back and, and you think, yeah, it's, I'm very lucky to have the career I've had, but I've also missed out on a, on a hell of a lot of really important Milestones, momentous, right? yeah. yeah, momentous things, man, in your life. Not only, you know, my life, but my family's life that people take for granted when they, you know, live in Australia and live near their family and work. They can just take a day off and go hang out. As a footballer, you, you can't do that. Yeah. There's no chance you can just take a day off. So, yeah. Um, yeah, man, a lot of sacrifices as well, which which people don't see. So I'm keen because I, for, for people who don't know, Johnny's a very proud father. He's got three boys that have grown up so quick. Um, and given their age, you were probably playing overseas for periods where they were well and truly um, alive. So 
did you have period long periods away from them and Marie and family? Uh, yeah, so well, yeah, that's one of the reasons that, that probably the reason why I left Romania was the fact that probably six months earlier I had a, had a deal to go to Germany to to a team in the Bundesliga, and um, my club was adamant, no, they they don't want to sell me, they don't want to sell me, and I had six months left on my deal and. I was very clear that my wife was pregnant at the time and Romania, I'd, I'd, I felt like I'd, I'd been there almost five years and um, it was enough. I, I needed a new challenge. My wife was pregnant. It's not somewhere I wanted to, to bring up my, my young child. Um, but they're adamant. No, no, I, I couldn't leave. So, you know, my wife was home for three, four months by herself at that stage before she gave birth and I flew home. Um, throughout the next period of time, we often travelled together. I went and played in New Zealand. We were always together, apart from obviously playing in the A-League. But at the end of my career, the last two years of my career, I played in, in Malaysia. That's um, right, too. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that was... I lived apart, mate. I, I so, lived apart for, for, for two years. So I was travelling back and forth whenever i get three days off. I would seriously go to the airport, jump on a flight and get home. It was a nine-hour flight direct to the Gold Coast. I'd spend a day and a half at home and, and I'd fly back. Um, so, so what's the the relationship with your kids back then? Probably what fa- through FaceTime stuff like that coming. Yeah, back, FaceTime. And, and even then, mate. Like I know people say technology is great, but <laughs> I tried to stay away from it because it, it made it even harder when I saw my kids on the phone or they were crying because they miss me or it, it made it really really challenging. So we spoke a lot on the phone. I didn't really want to see them too much because it, it made it almost unbearable. So. Mm. For two years, I was away, mate, and effectively living my dream and, you know, supporting my family. That's that's paramount. But that was the fundamental reason why I retired in the end. I um, it, it just wasn't worth it anymore to miss out on some really, really important family time. And my, like you said, my young boys were, were growing up pretty fast. My wife was, was back in Australia building a house, looking after three kids by herself, and that's not fair, mate. Yeah, so yeah, got tough. to the point where yeah, got to the point where my 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 career was was you know it was too selfish to keep going. So yeah. I decided to call it a day. No, I mean I, I can imagine it would be so tough. I mean I always admired the the boys who had kids playing professional football. I felt like it was just such a tough task to manage both and be effective in both. But one thing I actually thought you did really well. Um, I probably want to go into our time together at Adelaide because. I essentially was a kid when I came to Adelaide and Johnny was the captain of the club at the time. I never forget, I never forget when I first met you. Yeah, we'll go into we will go into that, but I'll never forget the first time I met you. And you always used to have a very cheeky kind of grin on your face when you come in the dress room and your demeanor when you used to shake people's hand. I never forget it. It was always like a very soft handshake, like you're you're kind of taking the piss out of it. Hey, hey, how you going, mate? Jakey boy, Johnny boy. And the first time, it's exactly what you said to me. I'm going, oh, I'm new, new to the team and club captain's walking at me and oh, I've got to introduce myself. Walk over to you, you go, Jakey boy, Johnny boy. <laughs> and you kept walking. <laughs> and I've gone, okay, uh, that's how it is here. So, um, no, I actually think our time in Adelaide, we had a really, really good time from just a, a player and performance. But I, I actually think you, you had some pretty hard times there. For, for yeah. what you gave to the club and, and you were leading it uh, really well, um, you know, probably what people don't see is how things can get shifted on the head really quickly with change of coaches and structures in mm. clubs and how that impacts players. So it'd be good to maybe get your side of the story on, on that period around the captaincy and the changeover and stuff like that. that... Yeah, so, so prior to coming to Adelaide in, was it 2011, I came there. Um, I played in Saudi for, for a year and before that I was in Wellington Phoenix for a couple of years and I was excited to come back to Australia. I was, I was really proud to, to, to come back there and get involved with a club that was very aspirational. We had a coach called Rennie Coolen, a Dutch coach that he'd spoke to me a few times on the phone and convinced me to, 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 to come home for, for for a football reason, you know, to, to play the way he wanted to play. And he was building a really good squad and I was excited about it. Um, the start of that year, we, we, we started really badly um, through, you know, I still respect Rennie to this day. He's a good coach, but these things happen in football and he was the head coach. And unfortunately, he, he got sacked not long into that season. And as you said, I, I was the, the club captain. So a lot of it, 
the conversations and the dialogue between the players and, and myself went, went, went through me to Rennie and we had chats with him and, and the club about various things. So um, once he left, um, an, another coach came in and, and one, he didn't like me straight away. And two, I, I had a history with this coach that, um, that, that wasn't pleasant. Mm. And he made it really challenging from day one to me, um, which, you know, you don't find often in football, I think. You might have fallings out with, with coaches, but from day one for a coach to come in and, and say to his captain and a, and a senior player, you're not playing for me for six weeks, you're out of here for no reason other than he just didn't like me. Yeah, I found it remarkable. And um, so, the, you know, the, the fascinating effect from that is like that conversation all of a sudden then goes back into your family and your kids who are in school. And it's like, well, I've got to chop and change shop because the coach has changed my family. Yeah. And you were, you were yeah. pretty settled in Adelaide. You bought a house. Um, yeah. I bought a house. Yeah. So the, like I said, the first year was such a challenging year. I, I struggled so much just to adapt, to settle. Like I said, my wife had, we had our third child there that, that first year and believe it or not, she had, um, we, we bought it, we bought a dog. So it was like, Two days after our third child, she decided, my wife, this was weeks before, we're going to get a dog. Yeah. And I said, babe, this is not a good idea. We've got three kids. I've got a lot of pressure on here. We don't need a dog. <laughs> and she said, yes, we do. So I lost that argument. So we got a dog. Anyway, I'll fast forward this story. It'll get to the good bits. So not long after when, when, when the coach got sacked and the new coach came in, I was having these challenges around the captain seat. I got home one day, mate. I was not, I, I hated it. I hated being at training. I hated being at the club. I, remember. I was really upset being at home. I was I was in all sorts, mate. And mm. we had this new dog that was digging up holes. I had a new baby that was screaming. I had two other babies that were quite young. Mate, it was chaos in my life. <laughs> and I got home one day and I said to my wife, I said, listen, it's the baby or the dog. One of them's got to go. I <laughs> and we ended up, luckily, getting rid of the dog, JVD. Yeah, so yeah. we got rid of the dog. But yeah, it was, it was, mate, that was the hardest probably challenge of my career, if I'm honest, because... It was the only moment in my career, and I'm, I'm proud about this, where I didn't play football. Mm. Every single other time I played football, whether the coach got sacked, you know, during the season, I always produced and, and managed to convince the new coach that I had value to play. Yeah. This was the only time in my 16-year career where I didn't play, and it wasn't because of football reasons. It was just because of a personality, and and that was really hard to deal with. Um, mm. and, and I. You know, struggle for a long time to get over that, mate. If no, I, re I remember. I remember vividly thinking this professional football world is is insane. Um, and to put some context to that, like when I was dreaming of being a footballer, I assumed when you got to the top, it was very rosy. You'd be in and out of squads, but you'd play. You play in front of big fans. You have this awesome feeling, and that's your life. I got to the Gold Coast, and. I was playing under Miron Bleiberg, the famous Miron Bleiberg there, playing with the, the lizard systems and all these various <laughs> systems at the time. And I had a really challenging period under him. I couldn't break in the squad. I was probably a bit, my, my physique was a bit too thin at the time to really handle the, the rigours of the A-League. Um, and then I started to get some games at the end and I just remember all this talk. And as I was, I was in this happy world of playing in the A-League, this dream's coming true. And then there was all this backward noise of, Oh, the club's not going to be around. It's a bit of a basket case, the funding. And next thing you know, within six weeks, the, the Gold Coast lost its license. My last year, my contract was gone. And then I, I was fortunate enough to get a deal with, you know, Michael Petrillo and Cozzy at Adelaide had signed me. It came down to a pretty good team. And then as soon as I got there, the three or four biggest players in yourself, Serge Van Dyke, Zenon Caravella, who, who had a great season at Adelaide, were being asked to, to isolate and train on their own at that period. Um, and I, was, I just couldn't understand what was going on. I was so shocked at the brutality of the industry at the time. I, it was fascinating for me. Yeah, it's challenging, you know, particularly as a, as a young player, like you said, JBD, you don't really, I guess, have too much experience or, or power in those situations. But it, it was challenging for the older boys too, because if I was a young player and I was in that position, and I hadn't, Unfortunately, you know, fortunately, been in that position in my career. But if I was a young player, I, I, I wouldn't say too much. Mm. You know, that that is what it is. But as a, as an older senior player, I have words, respectful words, with this coach around rationale. I even spoke to the club, the chairman, and the president about it um, openly. And 
it just wouldn't change. Mm. And it was really challenging, mate. But there's a lot of football politics that, that exist in the game and it's always going to exist. And it's just probably how, how well you adapt and how well you understand that game. And that's why this whole football industry understanding, I like to call it, is, is such a crucial part of being a football. It's not just... True. If you can dribble, if you can kick a ball, all this stuff, it's, it's really understanding the, the intricacies of, of football and what it means to, to be a player. Yeah, if, if I'm player honest, struggled. I don't think I ever got that, grasp that, because I struggled with pretty much every coach I had with dealing with <laughs> the challenges. You got it, yeah, and, and it's hard, right? Like, it's not something you can pick up a book and read. It's, it's about managing the situation, hopefully having a few older boys to help you through and True. um it, it's it's a really challenging one that a lot of our younger players today and probably you know your generation even a lot of my generation struggle with and and, and a large reason why they didn't go on and have you know longer careers yeah um, what was it like for you in that period when you were on the outer as such you didn't really like the environment because you weren't being treated up at the same time you were settled off the field with your family what was that like when you're every day driving into training for you I hated it, mate. Yeah. I honestly hated it. And, and I, I was unfortunately wired in a way that I always went. I always turned up on try, time. I always trained. Like, I very easily could have rung up and been sick or, or gone to a doctor. Because if I would have gone to a doctor and, and, and seen someone, there's no doubt I was going through major depression. Major, mm. mate. I was, I was in a really bad way. But I still turned up. I trained. I did what I had to do. I left. I didn't answer my phone. Um, but it was, it, it was really, really challenging, mate, really difficult. And, um, you know, I was lucky I had, like you touched earlier, a, a great family. I still do have a great family that were really supporting and I'm lucky to have a, a great wife and, and, you know, she'd been with me, uh, you know, for the duration of my career. So she managed, you know, the ups and ups and downs, so to speak, this was clearly one of my biggest downs and I, I struggled to get out of it, but, um, the support of them really helped mate. No, I remember you being pretty down, but still, for, for me, I thought you handled yourself pretty well. Um, and considering that we had, a, I think, three coaches in th well, two years or even a season at Adelaide, uh, mm. you ended up coming out, I guess, with, with Josep, uh, this, uh, the Spanish coach at the time, who had that really, I guess, Barcelona-driven philosophy of how he played, and you became a big part of it. And all of a sudden, it's like the shift of the world of, you know, you're being isolated and not wanted, taken off of the captaincy, and then all, all of a sudden, you're in the, the coach's plans again at the same club in the same environment and you become a key figure for how we implemented that philosophy. It's, you know, it's, it's a strange world, how quickly it can change, you know, things change quick in life. And yeah. 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 It's, it's challenging, right? When, when coaches, I guess when clubs are so coach power driven, some of them and give the, the coach such a powerful responsibility, it's, it's a challenge. Um, but like I said earlier, I was really, it's still hard to understand and I don't think there ever be an answer about why mm. I was treated like I was treated. Um, and, and, um, I guess that the, the icing on the cake was that there was a new coach, um, that came in that liked me. And then there was another coach after that, that also mm. liked me. And I managed to show my value and, and also I think show a bit of value to, to, to a lot of the, the fans and people in Adelaide that, really saw me as the issue there um, for, for a long period of time. That The club didn't start well. I was the club captain. The coach got sacked. I was getting blamed left, right and centre. Um, I was clearly thrown under the bus by um, the club and, and not being supported. But, you know, I hung in there. I did what I had to do. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to, to get an opportunity and show my value and, I guess, came out the other side. It was character building, mate, because it's not easy. It's not easy to... Oh, it's hard to watch, mate. Yeah. 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 But, I, I remember. You know, it, happens, it happens to a lot of people. Um, yeah. but, you know, you build your resolve, mate. Anyway, so, yeah. Um, I guess, Johnny, one of the things I was keen to start talking on is really the, the transition of those last few years. You mentioned when you're in Malaysia and, and the idea of you were coming out of the game and... I guess, as I've documented to you and, and most recently, I've really struggled with coming out of the game. Probably more, my struggle was a little bit different to, to you coming out of the game. Mine was more because I didn't reach where I wanted to get to at the time and went into a bit of, bit of a dark space with it of how I um, took that when really probably could have you know, realised I was young and had some time to get back in. But I, I took it the other way where I didn't want to come back in after it. Um, but for you, you really had a decorated career 
And I guess your choices of of finishing the game were more family orientated and for the people to be close to the people you loved and stuff like that. So obviously that's one aspect of it, but the other aspect is, is then, you know, what, what for you, were you already sort of planning how you were going to live your life? You know, the work you're now doing, what were some of the maneuvers you were making to kind of give you that active lifestyle outside of football when it changed? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, mate. And it's one I'm really passionate about because I've seen so many players that I've played with that were miles better than me, mm. that didn't make it. Were miles better than me, mate. And for for luck, for for for, for injuries, for coaches, that they didn't make it. And they struggle still to this day, mate. I speak to them and they, they, they've never fully been able to accept it or move on. So the the part of the game that is the hardest is this transition. We talk about transitioning out of the game, but your whole career is a transition. You know, you move from club to club, you move from league to league, country to country. It, it's it's a constant transition, football world. It's not like in the rugby league circles or the AFL circles where you're not going to go anywhere, really. That's the pinnacle, right? Mm. You can't go anywhere in AFL. You start a club, you sign a five-year deal, happy days. Yeah. You go to an NRL club, you might sign a five-year deal, you might move to one or two clubs, maybe go to the Super League if you want to cash in a little bit. But this is the pinnacle. With us in football, this is really a stepping stone, the A-League. Every player would almost have dreams, I'd, I'd, I'd imagine, like myself and yourself, to play overseas, to play in the big leagues, to challenge yourself, to earn money. And the challenge is it's, it's a constant transition. So the, the last probably five, six years of my career, I started thinking about it more and more, mm. um, what I wanted to do. And I was fortunate to... You know, to to have been involved with the, the PFA, the Players Union, for for a long time. I sat on the PFA executive for eight years, and I liked the fact that they supported players. And I, I wouldn't have got through some of my issues overseas without the support of the PFA. Um, so, you know, I was angling more towards going down that route because I really like supporting the players. There's obviously the agency route. The, mm. There was my mind was thinking maybe I'll get away from football together, do something completely different. But there's that, that 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 fear in a lot of players, right? And I'm sure you've experienced it. Of if I don't do football, what do I do, right? Like mm. like uh, who am I? What what, what skill set do I have? Like how am yeah. I going to start my life again, right? It's like we've gone to the university of football for the last 15, 20 years, and then you come out and it's like, well, do you keep your education in other forms of football, like your coaching or being an agent or yeah. you play, or do you go to something different? Yeah. That's so scary. Yeah. So yeah. scary. Yeah, so, so the last few years of, of my career, I started thinking more and more about it, started doing a bit of study and then connected and, and now I work at, at, at the PFA, um, built up over the last three years and I'm really passionate about the role I do because it's having been through that system without someone supporting me in the role kind of that I do now, I think it's it's fundamental. So I, I'd studied a fair bit towards the end of my career, but if I'm honest, mate, that's why I'm... I speak to a lot of players now and part of my role is really that education piece around players and balancing their career and their life. When I was playing, there was this, you were told no distractions, right? Just play football. Don't worry about anything else. Don't look at a job. Don't look after football. Just purely and simply focus on football. You don't want any distractions. Mm. And that was drilled into me as a young kid. And I know a lot of other players were were drilled into me, but the more I, I learn about, the world and about sport that was such a wrong message to send to players and it was and still is that the the fundamental i think issue for why a lot of players in any code struggle when they post their career because they haven't planned and and, and organized themselves to have that balance of a career and and, and football Mm. or whatever it might be so um uh, I struggled, mate, the first couple of years, even though I was ready. Um, I, I decided to retire. It was my choice. I still had some some options to play, but I, I ended up, my wife has an aircon refrigeration business. So I ended up coming back and kind of that conversation we had earlier, I thought, well, let's, I want to get away from football. I could have yeah. done some coaching, could have played. I'm like, no, nah, I just want to get away from it for a while. Got on the tools, so did you? <laughs> yeah, mate, I went and worked on the tools. And if you've looked at my hands, mate, these are <laughs> tough hands, mate. Yeah, they're not made for it, mate. <laughs> uh, so, so I went and did that for you know four months and that was really enjoyable got away from the football circle but slowly and surely I got dragged back and like I said earlier I'd always had an affinity and a, a relationship with the PFA and 
a role came up that interests me and I spoke to him about it and ended up getting this role and now building up to, to the role I do now, which is really supporting the players. Man, um, I, so, I think that's so, so good that you had that thinking going in um, or coming out of your career to be that way, even though probably initially the, the shock to the system is the whole structure change of getting up and going to training, uh, yeah. preparing for a game. Like even though there's that release of change of life and you're kind of into it at the start, but that's a massive shock to the system, that yeah. kind of robotic yeah. life we were used to living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, if I'm honest and I look back, mate, even though I was semi-prepared in a way, I wasn't. And the last couple of years of my career, I didn't enjoy. Mm. I didn't enjoy because I was always wondering and worrying about what next, right? And, and I wasn't fully ready for that transition. And uh, if I was, I have no doubt, I would have played the last few years, maybe even played longer um, back home for, 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 for very little money, just because I enjoyed it. And I knew I had something to go straight into. Yeah. But you know, like I said, I was brought up with just focus, 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 and don't worry about having a, a balanced life. And, you know, in a lot of other sports that works, you know, the swimmers and a lot of the Olympians are told you've got a four year cycle, just focus on that. No distractions. Right. But mm. with our code, with the, the, the transient nature of it, mate, you can, you can be gone like that. And you know mm. that all right. too well, right? Yeah. Injury, yeah. Form, and then you end up being 25, 26 and, and having no money in the bank, not really a, a deep skill set that you think is transferable. And, you go through a bit of a spiral of struggles. Uh, yeah, because I think everyone looks at the, and it's probably for most sports, everyone looks at the people at the top of their game in those sports, you know, LeBron James, Lionel Messi's or whatever. And when they're finished, that they are set for life. That They've probably got all these sponsorship deals and money, but for 90% of the people who are playing at the highest level, you're probably going to have to work after you, put, after you finish your sport or your career. Yeah, yeah. And, and when you think about the professional, you know, the lifetime of a professional career, it's probably five to 10% of your life. Um, so to, to think that we're so wide on, yes, we should maximize it, but to not really think of what are we going to do for the rest of our life, which is a you know, longer period, but we're going to need to consume something else for longer. Um, it's pretty crazy, but a yeah. blindside, it blindsided me. I'd be really keen to, to understand the conversations you have now with a lot of the younger players around the A-League because you're in your role as a player development uh, manager where you're, you're engaging with a lot of the players, seeing how they're doing and, and whatnot. But what's some of the advice you're giving the younger players now to better prepare for some of those, I guess, transitions and changes that are inevitable throughout their career and post? Yeah, it, it, it's a hard one, right? Because we're all young one time or another and we, we, we have our blinkers on and want to go to training and play Xbox and think we're, you know, Ronaldo and Messi and, and that's fine, right? Um, I guess the support, we are, we're support when the players need it, right? That, that's the fundamental thing. They know where to turn. They know what we're doing, our roles, and that's really important. So a lot of the advice that, you know, we start with is pretty much kind of what you said, JBD. If football was to end tomorrow, what would you do? Mm. How prepared are you? Are you financially prepared? Are you emotionally prepared? Have you got a CV? Have you got a skill set? You know, what, what, what's your background? If football stopped tomorrow, and it will stop, that's the only guarantee. In our world of football, there's only one guarantee. It will end. Mm. And it will either end by your choice, by your body's choice, or by lack of form in a club. There's only three ways. And I was fortunate that it was my choice, and I still struggled. Yeah. So you put yourself in the bracket of a lot of players that do struggle with transition, that they're not ready for it, you know, and you're probably, you're one that, 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 you know, have gone through that, you know, which is a really challenging thing to go through. So a lot of stuff we do, we do a lot of surveys with past players. A lot of our information that we talk to players is really factual. So, and, and a lot of the challenges around transition. So we, we do a lot of surveys with former players and ask a variety of questions and, and that's confidential in nature. But the whole point is those findings really help us shape one, the gap in support that we have for our former players mm. and two, really help educate the current generation. We present this to them and say, look, you know, one in four players get divorced within two years of finishing their career, mate. Wow. One in four. And that's a remarkable statistic if, if you think about it. Um, one in three have major financial issues, you know. One in three have major mental health and well-being issues. So they're pretty alarming stats if you consider, you know, you're in a change room with, 
23, 24 are guys and, you know, six or seven of them are going to have pretty major issues. So it's pretty remarkable. And the purpose of this is not to, to scare them, but it's to, to show them that Give this them is facts, reality. Right? Yeah. yeah, this is reality, right? And I'm there to help you hopefully not fall into this bracket or this bucket of players. And this is what we can do for you. Let's start sitting down and figuring out what you like, what are your interests away from the game? Where do you see yourself if you weren't playing football? Because, you know, football is just your job, mate. Mm. It's your job. It doesn't define you. A lot of people think it does because, you know, you're a footballer. Definitely. It's just a job. Mate. It's a job. Yeah. And you might be very good at it. You might love it. But, you know, who you are as a person, I think, is really important. And the amount of players we, we ask, you know, that question around football and that they, they see themselves as footballers. That's all they are. Mm. So just that education piece, I think, Jake, is, is, is the most important aspect. Talking to them, building that rapport, talking about the challenges and the struggles that may eventuate whenever they come and letting them know that we're there to support them. And sooner or later, you know, that penny will drop, whether they be 19, 20, whether it be 25. And you know, it's interesting to note when that does happen, whether it's you know, lack of form or injury or players getting older in age. Mm. Um, but it's a, it was a challenging one for, for myself and probably you as well to go through this kind of alone. It wasn't, oh. There wasn't a lot of support. Man, I remember us having various sessions with the PFA coming down and, and we'd get various speakers at the club to come in and talk broader around, you know, life and, you know, broadening perspective than just football, which I look back on now is tremendous. Uh, they'd come in for a, tra- uh, a presentation after training. I remember being 18, 19, 20, thinking like, oh, fuck this. I, I, don't, I don't need this. This is, yeah. yeah. It, it, it hits in the moment and then an hour later I'm out and I'm, I'm living my life. And... God, what I, when I think back now, I think what a naive way to look at it, considering especially my situation, which is not normal for most, even though the A-League, I still feel, has a, a high volume of turnover of, of players. Um, but I just never thought it'd be relevant for me. And then, you know, when it was, um, that unpreparedness for what's next and the nature, luckily I was young, I still had time on my side to really figure it out. But for someone like yourself, when you, when you come out, you've got three kids, you've got a wife, you've got pressure to yep. perform you know in that space too which is um you know i can imagine much more challenging than than for a 21 year old in the sense because i've got a whole path ahead of me to work on so yeah yes and no right look it's 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 challenging for anyone mate like everyone's in their own unique circumstance that and that's that's why it is really challenging because you might view you know a senior player that's had a great career and transition into a role and you think they're really happy and doing you know awesome away from the field and they might be struggling mate mm. they really might be struggling and i've spoken to a lot of players you know in my role now and the players that, reach out to you let you know if they're, they're not yeah, in a good spot. Yeah. And, yeah they are and that's the whole building of rapport right like having that trusting environment and, and letting them know who we are and what we do and hopefully that getting them that stigma away from needing help. Mm. You know, we all need help from time to time and we all need to reach out from time to time. And I'm hopeful that having been a former player, a lot of those relationships um, that I've formed or or continue to form have a bit of weight. And and they think that, you know, he's been through kind of something similar to what I may be going through. Um, Mm. Might be a good opportunity to have a chat. So It's, it's pretty hard to, hide it for one as a footballer but a lot of players do it well but then let alone the the, the pressure you have on the, the high performance nature of playing at the highest level to play at your best and carry that off the field uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty tough act um yeah. so I, I you know i advise any players out there it's great that we have people like you johnny reaching out having that conversation because i still think a lot of codes don't do that enough and if they do you know, how effective it is, but it seems like we're making some progression there from a football. We're trying. Yeah, we're trying, mate. We're chipping at the, we're really just chipping at the top of the iceberg. There's so much more we could do in this space um, through education, but unfortunately it comes down to, to funding and, and having that ability to really make a, a meaningful impact on, on players' lives and, and on people's lives, more importantly. You know, a lot of the players are, their football career is pretty good at the club and they've got coaches and strength conditioners and nutritionists, all that's looked after, but their mental health and wellbeing side is a huge, a huge part of, of how you become a professional football and whether you will or will not make it. And 
you know, you're not taught about this stuff. Mm. You're not taught about it. You have to learn it, you know, and hopefully, you know, the more we're around and the more we can get access to players and educate them and, and the better our program is, then you'd like to think that would have an impact on the players. Yeah. It's, it's almost that players now invest so much into their physical performance and physical bodies, you know, from a therapy point of view, but just to get themselves ready to play. But there's not too much uh, investment in, I guess, the mental aspect. And Mate, well, you look, you, you, you drive down the street or walk down the street or run down the street. How many people are in gyms? Mm. There's, there's thousands of possibly millions in gyms every day. Why? Because they want to look good. Mm. But how many of those people actually go and sit down with a psychiatrist or, or someone of a counselor to talk about what's going on up here? and get their feelings out and get their emotions out. Cause that is far more important than the physical attributes, mate. And we just, you know, we don't do it. We don't do it. Whether it's because of this stigma, whether it's because you can't see it, it doesn't exist, right? That's the big mm. stigma of the fitness. I'm getting big muscles. Look at me. I feel great. But inside you might feel like shit, right? And if we can break down that barrier, I think, then we're on the right path to, to like I said, make a really good humans. Do you reckon there's still a gap with players feeling they can't go over to the gaffer and say, mate, I'm, I'm not doing well. I, I'm, I'm struggling. To, do you reckon there's, there's players still prevent, worried about doing that? Yep. Yeah. I, I feel, I, I think if I put myself in their position when I was playing, I would have struggled to do it. Even, and I was going through stuff off the field, nothing significant, but just like I was really struggling not playing. And, and even just my own sort of, I was, I was taken off the field with me at home and then coming back and it just wasn't a good cycle, but I'd never voice it. I just, you know, live with it and hope it will change, which I, I, f- I fear still a lot of players do today because it's probably not accepted. Um, yeah, it's, or, it's still, yeah. And there's, there's some of the, the, you know, the new age coaches that are, have more ability to, to understand and get to know the player, right? And there's some coaches that don't want to know anything about that player, you know? Mm. And I think, I, I, I think that knowing the person is so important, you know? But that relationship between coach and player is is crucial, and that's why I think that that you know the role that we play, we sit kind of independently of, of the club, so we sit in this neutral space where we we're a really safe space for players. They know that whatever they talk to us about is confidential in nature and won't get back to the club. And at the same time, we have the ability to hopefully help them, and if not, we can outsource to to experts that hopefully will put them on a path to to getting better. So yeah. there is, mate, without a doubt, there's there's you know, many, many players that, that are struggling that are reluctant to speak to coaches for the fear of, you know, suffering some sort of fate, whether it be non-playing, whether it be ridiculed, whether it be, you know, just feeling probably worse than they did when they brought it up. At the same time, there are coaches that are really good in this space, right? Yeah. So it's that balancing act, mate. Mm. It's usually the ones that have gone through it themselves that are pretty good at it. The ones that haven't yeah. probably are less open to or understanding of it as well. Yeah, um, I think so as well. Well, Johnny Boy, it's been a been a pleasure, mate. The the number one on the belt, the first one on the Unlaced podcast. Um, pretty rapt to have you on. I think that was an awesome conversation. So much, actually, was really keen to get your perspective on the time we were in Adelaide, which is really interesting for me to understand your side of the fence to that story because I probably wasn't as close to you at that time. I only, only just met you, but I could only imagine what that had been like that period. So. Um, really interesting to hear that perspective um, from you. So I appreciate you sharing that and being so candid with everything. And I think the work you're doing now across the game, mate, is you're one of the great men in the, in the football arena for us. So hopefully we continue to see growth in some of these areas off the field and hopefully that translates to better stuff on it too. Thanks, mate. And, and let me say, I'm, I'm proud of you as well, buddy. Like, <laughs> Thanks, through, mate. You've been through your own struggles, mate. Let's let's be honest. It's 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 hard for everyone. So I'm proud that you've started to do something that you know you have a have a way to share your story and, and show your skills mate because it's um everyone's got everyone's got something to say mate everyone's got a story and everyone deserves to be heard so if this is your way to to to, to you know i guess give back to the game and share your stories and hopefully open people's eyes mate I, I'm, I'm happy to help out any time and I couldn't be a bigger supporter of you, so I'm proud of you, brother. Nah, thanks, Johnny Boy. I love you, mate. Appreciate it. And say hi to the family, Marie. I'm sure she's doing some sort of uh, construction work in the house. She, <laughs> she owns the tools, not you. <laughs> yeah, she is the handyman as well in this family. I told you, look at these hands, mate. <laughs> yeah, they're not made for it, mate.
Uh, uh, all, all good, Johnny boy. Thanks again, mate. I'm sure we'll have you back on, um, you know, not too far distant in the future. So thanks, mate. Dream big, JBD. Thank you.